Hello everyone, this is uh, Pastor Paul Miner with uh, Pastor uh, Basie and Pastor Dedine here, uh, joining her for our second session of our Prairie Whispers online Bible study. Uh, again, we thank you for coming uh, and watching us, and we are uh, looking at uh, the Lutheran liturgy with our, our study of uh, why, why do we do this? Uh, looking especially at what we do in church itself, the liturgy, our order of service. Uh, we talked a, a number about a number of things last time, we'll get into that, but as always, I think it's fitting that we start our, our study with prayer. I will ask uh, Pastor Dine to uh, lead us with an opening prayer today. Sure. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask that you would bless our time together. We ask that in all our doings, we will be doing your will. Lord, we know sometimes that we want to put ourselves first, and we just ask that we put you first here. We ask that you teach us what we need to know about our liturgy, about why we come and we worship you, and about the many gifts that we receive from you in our worship service. We ask this all in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, just to review where we picked up uh, from last time. We talked a little bit last time. I think one of the big things that we, we came... Uh through last time is that there is a, a divine element of um, all Christian worship that uh, God is there God is directing that worship through the divine elements of the, the proclamation of the word and the celebration of the sacrament and I think those are two things that we always have to remember that really when we look at the 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 guts the chassis if you will right, of, right. Of, the, of the Lutheran yep. hot rod we call the liturgy um, it really is a divine action of God, and that, that doesn't change. I, I've been doing a study on the book of Numbers, for instance, looking in the Old Testament, at their forms of worship, which, have, granted, were much more rigid because they were looking forward and they were picturing something that had not yet taken right. place yet. And, but yet, even there, if you strip down all those to the basic elements, it is the proclamation of the divine promise of salvation through a Savior and the sacramental action bringing that uh, to uh, um, the people uh, through the Old Testament forms and worships um, that were, again, a, a foreshadowing of what, what we celebrate today. However, we also talked that there is certainly a human side and a side that grows out of the natural spirit with a small s response uh, to um, what God is doing. And uh, we talked about that with uh, liturgy. We talked about that with hymnody especially, uh, the, the language we use in worship, uh, the, the form of the sermon. And so at one time when we talk about liturgy, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be looked the same way in every congregation everywhere. Right. We have never right. insisted that there's a uniformity in all places and all times. Yep. Um, even among um, our training, you we were trained at Bethany Lutheran Seminary, but even among those more in fellowship with those, there, there are certainly unique flavors okay. even yep. in that, yep. and even in our certain separate synods, there's flavors, but we all recognize that there is that divine action and human response to it. Um, and again, we always let the divine action guide it, uh, that we, we talked especially how uh, liturgy should always be theocentric, always gospel proclaiming, and that, those two things come first, and then there's a response to that and a, and a kind of a collective. But I think what we want to do today, um, uh, picking up there, is um, talk about especially what happens when we come into worship. And I, I, I kind of like to just uh, begin with a quotation. This is actually from a letter that uh, uh, John Adams writes to his uh, wife, Abigail Adams, during the Constitutional Convention. Uh, you can find this letter in full in uh, uh, the great biography of John Adams, um, uh, written a number of years ago, turned into an HBO miniseries as well. Um, but now this is not a Lutheran church they're visiting, granted. Uh, this is a Catholic church they're visiting. However, I think that wait, wait. I, 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 I think that you can. There, there are things about it that I think you would you would say this. But there's there's one part of this this that I think that that really touches that. These men are all children of the Enlightenment. They're mm -hmm. children of pure reason. They're yep. children of uh, natural law. They're children of that. But they come in and there's just something about it that really kind of, of, of gets them. And I just want to read um, a little bit of their, of their, now again, this is a Catholic worship, so we want to put, we, we're not advocating everything that's in this quotation, and not at all. But I, I think there is something that we, ha and we can talk about this, that right. we find this experience, especially with visitors, coming to our worship as sure. well. There's yep. something uncomfortable here, yep. and what, what exactly is the uncomfortable thing here? Now, this afternoon's entertainment, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, where, uh, where what they did for entertainment, what we do here for entertainment uh, is very different, but yep. um, was to me the most awful, and here Adams doesn't mean awful in the term like yuck, but filled with awe, um, and affected. The poor wretches fingering their beads, chanting their Latin, 
um, not, wor not a word of which they understood. Uh, their holy water, they're crossing themselves. He's describing the, the altar here with its rich images and crucifixes, wax candles lighting up. But how shall I describe the picture of our Savior in frame of marble over the altar at full length upon the cross in agonies and the blood drop and streaming from his wounds? The music consisting of an organ, a choir of singers, went all afternoon except at servant time, and the assembly chanted most sweetly and exquisitely, here is everything which can lay hold of the eye, ear, and imagination, everything which can charm and bewitch the simple and the ignorant. I wonder how Luther ever broke the spell. And what I would say is I don't think Luther ever did break the spell, personally. I think that Luther cleansed it of its abuses, certainly. Right. But let's just, I'm just going to throw this one for you guys to discuss. What is this uncomfortable thing that a person, again, is a child of rationalism, who prides themselves of their, their view? What is it they're coming into contact with when they're coming into worship that is so uncomfortable for them? So I'll start with you, uh, Pastor uh, Basie, and uh, we'll just go around and have some comments here. Uh, yeah, I, I guess <clears throat> for me when I read that quote, and I, I don't know if I'm completely off, just tell me I'm completely off. But like, even for a person that's rational, I mean, you walk, you walk into the church service, you walk into this situation, and all of a sudden you're not the main character of your life anymore. The liturgy puts you in a divine storyline where the main character is our savior and the main focus is God's love for us. And, and therefore the world, because, you know, like even the, even the enlightenment, it, it revolved around our rational reasoning, even today to an extent, you know, I'm, I'm the rational being in my life that makes the decisions. And the liturgy comes and kind of destroys that completely as you walk in and you, you know, you see, oh, there's this much bigger thing than me that not only is bigger than me, but dictates, you know, my life. And I think the other part of that, too, especially with that cr the image of the cross, you know, if you're not used to the liturgy, I, I think about what's being said, too, about the fact that the cross is foolishness to the wisdom of the world, and, and therefore, you know, there's another foreign element of, you know, why are we worshiping this, to, this person that was crucified and died? Like, he sounds like a loser. I guess in my sense. So those are two areas I guess that would make it feel odd, you know, or uncomfortable maybe to the new person. But I, I, I think, uh, Pastor Diana, I think Pastor Basie is touching on something very well, that when you walk into especially the divine element of the liturgy, um, and, but even the reflection of it in the human elements, I mean, hy hymns are not always the easiest things to sing, sure. and the liturgy is not always the easiest thing to follow along. Yeah. Um, but um, this idea that I, I'm not in control, mm -hmm. um, that I'm not the central actor. Um, let's, let's explore that a little further, this, this central um, tension between I, I have an expectation as a consumer to be served, but now I come in and I'm actually being told to serve or that, some, or that someone far greater than me is serving me. Right. And, and, and let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I definitely think it's one where trying to put yourself second is not a place that many people appreciate being, for lack of a better term. Um, it's kind of funny because where I, in listening to Pastor Basie, where my mind was going in sociology, uh, Emil Durkheim, don't worry. Um, but when he looked at religion, he looked at a lot of it as collective effervescence and just, you know, what's built up there is these people coming together and just building up this, this effervescence, this, this like feelings, they're just building it up as they're together. Um, and so it reminded me of recently, I forget the school that it was at, but they had a couple weeks long, like revival or whatever. Or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. about? And like, and so going into, so even as, so putting it this way, even as a Lutheran, I think walking into that, I'd be like, this is just weird. You know, like whatever they were going for. And because, so I think part of it also is just that that group has a very specific understanding of who they are, what they're doing. So as a new person comes in, you feel very much like an outsider. Um, relating a personal story, I remember when I first went to a church and there was not a lot of what we learned in seminary called shepherding. You know, oh, turn this page, go to this page, we'll do this. This is what we're singing next. There wasn't a lot of that. It was just expected that you knew it. Mm -hmm. And so when I went there and everyone is just, 
singing these songs and saying these these words I'm like how do you guys know to say this stuff like where do you do <laughs> and they just and and so yeah it's just coming in and being completely new to it it's something and so when that when you feel off there it, it can be very difficult and very off putting and that's one where people themselves so coming back to what you're asking people themselves they want to feel comfortable and so when they don't feel comfortable and they walk in and it's new and it's different and everybody else knows what's going on and I'm the outsider it can be very hard for them to want to be a part of that I okay, so I think there's two things here I think there's a natural <clears throat> response whenever you walk into something yep. that is new um, there's always a period of I, you know, what, what's expected yep, yep, to be. Yep. Um, I, I, for instance for me I've never felt comfortable for instance uh, 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 like a Dancing. I'm not sure. I don't like it. Yep. I can, I'll, I'll just do about anything, but I won't get it. it. has nothing to do with my religious beliefs. I just don't like it. I don't feel comfortable doing it. Um, one of my favorite quotations from the, 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 the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, is that, uh, you know, the, the main character, Sheldon, there's there's infinite versions of me, but none of them dance. Right. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, you know I, I, can, I can relate to that comment. Um, so there is that natural, you know, uh, thing. But I, I think that there's also something here where, where we have this... And the only way I can say it is this spooky feeling that um, that um, something is here beyond sure. the wood of the pew, beyond the, the, the beauty of the stained glass, that in, in some ways is enticing me here, in some ways is seeing me, seeing through me here, and I'm, I'm at the time attracted and repelled at the same time, but the one thing I'm not is is in control right and i think that's one of the things and again i think one of the things that separates we, we do try to put on emotional bumpers to a certain extent we, we don't have altar calls we don't have we don't try to shake people we don't we don't right. expect right. people yeah. to shout out and say amen or, or even even clapping is, is sometimes a little bit risky well, you uh, <laughs> but uh, but um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think in general what, what we tend to do is that i've always found our worship very emotional but I think we want to make sure that the emotion that we're feeling is God-driven, not, right, right. not yep. manipulation of another human being. Right. And I think that's one of the things that, that very... But again, I think that's one of the things that we recognize that when we come into worship, there's there's something going on here. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it comes back now getting into our the specific thing we want to look at today. Um, the first part of our liturgy every morning when we come in for a, a Sunday service, um, we kind of divide the liturgy into three basic parts. We prepare to hear the Word of God. Yep. We hear the Word of God. Yep. We take the meal of God. We take the we take the so it's it's you know preparation, yep. service of listening, the word, and and yep. and, uh, and receiving uh, in in, a, in not just in an audible way but in a bodily way. Um, the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, and again, one that encapsulates all the senses, and one that that comes at us with the gospel in many different ways. But what we're focusing, especially now, is, is this first part of the service, where we would talk about, um, you know, coming into the presence of God. So uh, one thing I, I think to begin with, as we look at the, the service itself, is that um, what. Um, what really is happening, or what really are we teaching when somebody enters into the service? Um, let's talk about just some of the things, maybe some of the customs that we have here, but especially the opening of the service, the, the um, maybe the opening hymn, and especially the invocation to start out with those two opening parts. But preparing opening invocations, the custom in most of the churches that I have, that usually about 10 to 15 minutes before church starts, there is music being played. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually, it was very quite common in my um, congregation growing up, and I still think it is, not that if you're going to talk, you stay out there to talk, yep. if you're going, yep. but once you come in and sit, there's an expectation of silence, an expectation to listen, an expectation to prepare, and then when the pastor comes out, and the pastor begins the service with either the, you know, traditionally either an opening hymn or, you know, for some, an, an, an introit, um, depending on which liturgy you're using. Yep. Um, and then the invocation. 
what what are we preparing ourselves for? And, and keep in mind our previous discussion, but what are we preparing ourselves for? We'll go in reverse order. So let's start with Jesse and work our way back this way. Well, I was going to say, actually, um, I picked this up from the pastor who was before me at my first call. And I was asked by the members if I could keep doing it, that he would come out and the first thing he would do, kind of, you know, by way of, hey, I'm Pastor I'm Pastor Dean I, and that way people know who I am. Mm -hmm. But also, are there any prayers that we'd like to offer to God this morning? Mm -hmm. Just simply because not everyone has the time to catch the pastor before church. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has that, you know, quick right on the slip of paper, hand it to the pastor secretly or whatever it is. Um, and so we've gotten, it, it, it takes a while at each different church, but then it, it also sets the tone, at least in my mind, and I'm trying to let the people know that part of what we're here for is to ultimately you know bring things to god i know that's it's not the invocation but you know mm -hmm. so we're setting that so we're setting that tone that when they come in here when we start we're getting ready because we're going to be approaching god so like let's get everything set for that part and then you know yeah for the invocation for me it's yes we have our opening hymn we have our invocation and it's just okay now we are <clears throat> Even though we sang the hymn first, it's kind of like for me that invocation, now we're starting. Mm -hmm. Now we're real, you know, we now have God's name on us. We are in the presence of God. Let's do what God wants us to do. Um, and so that's just one where even before a service, if certain things have to be explained or it's not that the service hasn't started, but like that happens out there. Okay, now we've started. And now we're really entering into the presence of God for these things and we're preparing and we're going to hear from him, but it's just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm, so I'm still young in this, so I'm still kind of trying to, to navigate my own waters with this because the culture is a little different down in Sanborn. You know, there is talking that goes on in the sanctuary. I got two kids that run around from time to time if mom's not there. Your but kids? My, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my kids. They're cute, though. They got that going for them. And, and the three-year-old did sit by herself pretty well almost the entire service go. last there Sunday but she did come up during the prayer of the church because she thought it was the announcements yeah okay so she prayed with me and then she walked off so <laughs> it worked out but anyway um so I, I for me I kind of I guess I take a shotgun approach because I was the same way you know you're you were silent in the sanctuary and the minute the pastor stepped out there you were already engaged in listening and, and I always I always liked having that that hymn just before you know, we start with the intro in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because uh, you think about all those Bible verses that talk about coming into the presence of the Lord with singing and rejoicing in the Psalms. They, they walked into the temple or they walked into Jerusalem singing those Psalms and how appropriate that is to start with a song praising God. And like you said, the minute that that is said in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now, now we're going to dive in. You know, now, now we have come into the presence of God with that praise, and we're going to hear what he has to say to us. And um, I know the one maybe unique thing that I do, that I don't know, you can tell me if I shouldn't or if I should, um, is before that hymn, when I step out there and I say good morning, I very quickly in two, three minutes just talk about here are the three readings today, here is the general service theme, so that before we sing this hymn, you have an idea of how this plugs into my life in general. And now we're going to really dive in and dig in there with the shovel. Right. right. And right. I'd just like to make a, a quick, you know, um, caveat here. I don't want anyone watching here to make make any assumption that we're passing judgment on any. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no, be no, no. Yeah. We, we're not making no. What we're trying to get behind is why has the church developed mm -hmm. this over the years? Yep. Because in all different cultures, yep. and it will look different, and we all recognize yep. it's going to yep. look different, mm -hmm. but what why are we doing this? And we're not making any judgment calls here. We're not making it, we're not passing any votes. We want to make that clear. So if, you, if you're at a church, one of the congregations I served in the, uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where our people were kind of far flung, mm -hmm. they did a lot of talking before service because this right, was yeah. the time they yep, got to see it. Yep. And again, we, we, we celebrate that fellowship. So we're not passing any judgment. I want to make sure oh, that's clear. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still, when we take those unique contours and responses aside. There's something that just keeps carrying on right. yep. from culture yep. to culture in response to the word. And I think there's, this may be it, and you, you guys can comment on this one, but I've always felt that when there's something that happens for me, maybe it's different for you, but for me, when I walk in the sacristy and when I put my robe on, and there's the sacristy prayer, I'm going to pray, and then there, there's something about it that says, 
okay, all those other thoughts that were all filling my mind, those all have to go, they go away. away. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. And 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 yep. suddenly the suddenly the cloud clears. Remember that. Oh yeah, Jesus is here too. Yep. This is not a job. I'm not performing a function. Right. I yep. Jesus is here now. We'll get to this later, but I think what we are modeling and demonstrating here collectively should also be done in our vocation, in our private home, in our family altar. Yeah. That should also be done, for instance, with a father around the table with his children when they pray and they read their scriptures or at bedtime with mother when they pray. There, that should also be a time where we're clearing the air. It's not as formal, of course, but, but where that, that and, and even personally, maybe there's times um, a person reads their meditation. For me, it's my morning study where just gonna let Jesus talk for a while. I'm not gonna yep, think yep, about it. And, yep. uh, but there's something about this. And uh, one of my favorite pastoral theology books I recommend it to all, even if you're not a pastor, it's an excellent uh, book, but written by Harold St. Pyle. And it's a pastoral theology book. And he makes the point that what we're really trying to model is the fact that we really are living in two realities. Um, we are living in the physical world. This is a place, this has matter, yep, this yep. has movement. You're a person, you're a being, there's blood moving, and this and that. And yet, at the same time, we are also in the reality that there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a spiritual realm of which we are part of. We are not just flesh and blood, we are also soul and spirit. And we are coming into the presence of him who created all of us in the sense that, that the, most of my problems in the material world <laughs> really are a result of the, the spiritual corruption that runs through. In fact, all of them are really a result. I was just reading an article today on why Generation Z is so unchurched, and they gave all these reasons. But then, isn't it interesting that Generation Z also has higher degrees of anxiety, higher degrees of loneliness, higher mm -hmm. degrees of... And I said, there, is there a connection somehow, a correlation between mm -hmm. this, this moving away from recognizing that you live in these two realities to we're simply flesh and blood we're simply a machine we're simply take sure. a pill and do a thing and i just don't think that human beings can live that way it's like we're not made to live that way sure. and uh and what what tends to happen is that we'll, they, they they indicate great counterfeit versions of that um again he's not by no no one ever accused him of being christian but friedrich nietzsche no one ever accused of, a, he's a German philosopher, for those of you who don't know, but he, no one ever accused him of being a Christian. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet, one of, one of his best, uh, uh, you know, best passages, I think, is that when he talks about how we've killed God, but now we have to make him over again. Mm -hmm. We have to fellowship, because we can't live without him. Right. And uh, I, I think that we're actually kind of seeing that, where, yes, yeah, so we, don't, we don't need the church, and what the first thing people do, they create their alternate religion, and their mm -hmm. alternate creed an alternate uh, belief, an alternate gathering systems, an ultimate, you can't, you're not made to live without it. And what we're really dealing with is not an absence of God, but a, a growth in false worship. Right. But I think going back to what we're doing here, we will go down that path if we don't take a moment, not just once a week, but really, but I think we're, we're, it's being taught and modeled here once sure. a week. We have to remember that we are in the presence of God, not merely in the church, but we are in the presence of God, mm -hmm. and to let those clouds part for a moment. So I, I just throw that out for discussion. Any, any comments on that? No, and I, yeah. I, yeah. so usually the way that I do it um, is about 10 minutes beforehand. I'm out there talking, you know, everything mm -hmm. else, just mm -hmm. yucking it up, don't get me wrong. But about 10 minutes beforehand, that's when I'll leave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always tell people, well, I'm going back to my little place, just hanging out back there. And it is just a time to come and, and center and you know get, get ready, vest. And then I'll come sit right here in the front pew and I'll spend time in prayer and everything else like that. And it's just a chance where if I am modeling anything, I, I do hope it is that, you know, yes, before worship starts, as the music is playing and you're just getting ready to just take that time of like, I mean, they don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, but in prayer and reflection and just in being here and just taking it all in for a couple of minutes before you're going to, it's just, I don't know. There's, there, there really is just something about it that even as a pastor, you know, you, you take that time to get ready because, I mean, you are God's representative. You are bringing God's word to his people in 
yeah, you know, as the sacristy prayer says, if it was up to me, I'd have ruined it yeah, a long time ago. Like, oh, yeah. You know, and like thank God yeah, it's not yeah. up to me. And I'm just I'm liturgy's a great example of that. Thank God it's and, not and, up to and, me. And, and, I'm and just doing yeah, what he says. Isn't the invocation in many ways the very tonic that's it, it I was yeah. I always laugh when we pray, give us this day our daily bread and then there's donuts after church. I always kinda laugh at yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, it's like, Okay, wow, well, you set a record on that one, God. Um where, where you know, because I mean that we, Luther even jokes about that, that you know, that prayer is answered before you can even make it. Mm-hmm. But when you think about the prayer of the invocation, God clear well it, there it is. Right. There it is. That that if it was left up to me, and by the way, if the whole purpose of this invocation is to let you know that it is not left up to you. Right. And right. the world is not on your shoulders. And I, I would say just as a pastor, again, and I think this is true for people also, for any of our parishioners, but I, I think it's true for pastors especially, but a lot of times most of my anxiety as a pastor, it comes from the, the sinful belief that God's kingdom rests on my shoulders, yep. and it doesn't. Yep. Um, I, am, I am a servant. I am to be faithful in the duties God has called me in front of, but... I, it is not my kingdom. I am not to control it. I am not a spiritual Caesar that says it. And that's hard for me to do at times because I can say, no, this is not right or this is not right. This isn't the way we should go. And a lot of times God says, you know, I, I got this. Just, right. This is what's happening. Yep. Just, yep. Just, just leave it um, and, and to leave that at, at that point. But let's, uh, let's move on to another uh, aspect of uh, uh, the opening. So we've talked about the, the opening uh, worship. We're, we're going to take some time to talk about him to me in general, so I'm not going to spend too much time on, on picking hymns. We'll can, talk about that later. Can I, I, make, can I make one hymns. point, though, yeah. about the hymns? Yeah. Um, my one caution mm-hmm. is there are churches where pastors are not overly involved in the worship committee. Mm-hmm. Please, any pastors listening... <laughs> Please, any parishioners who are part of a worship committee where your pastor is not part of it, beg him to be there. Because if we're setting up that these hymns are vital or at least important and matter to what is happening that day, especially from the pulpit, there should actually be connections there. And I appreciate Service Builder and it suggested hymns and everything, but like... Please be an active part in that and do not be passive in that at all. It is important. So one thing, again, I, 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 I use, uh, again, we, some of us use different uh, screens. I use the historic right, right, yeah. But I, I, I've always appreciated, what I use to pick my hymn or my opening hymn is I'll usually use the traditional intro of the usual entrance right. song. Yep, yep. And the reason I usually pick that and I'll use, I'll usually use that guide to look at the hymns that will reflect that if I'm not going to use it itself is because ultimately that first hymn does set the tone right. for the day. Right. I mean that like, the, and, and and by the way it sets the tone for the day and it sets this is what God is going to teach us. Yep. Get ready, this is what God's yep. going to teach us for this Sunday. Now again going back to um, the hymnal of our sister synod, the Even Jump Luther Hymnary and, and its predecessor, what I really liked about that hymnal it was organized. I mean you, you really didn't have to pick hymns. Right. These are Every the four weeks, hymns for this these, are the these are the four hymns for the next Sunday. These are the four hymns for that you know yep. so yep. You, you didn't even really have to pick hymns. You just you just sang through the hymnal, um, I, I would say that it, you have to work a little harder with our hymns because, again, it's we're living. It's not a judgment. We're living a different time. Right. Yeah. But yep, yep. but I would say one of the most important things I like in in uh, um, service builder, or if you use the old, is find out what the scriptural references for all those hymns. Right. And that yeah. that does a yep. wonderful job bringing it. To, okay, this is or. If you know and you study, and I'm assuming that pastors and worship people are studying what we're doing each Sunday for liturgical worship, it's not hard once you know the theme of the day right, to, to find a hymn yep. that matches the theme yep. of the day. Um, but yeah, an important point about the opening hymn, and I think it should. The other thing, the other thing I'd say is that the first hymn should be extremely singable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, my, my one aesthetic yeah. advice is because I want people to not only take the message but to feel free to get into it. Yep. If you're going to pick a hard hymn, sermon hymn, knock yep. yourself out. Yep. But for the opening hymn, closing hymn, those should be right. well-known, easy to sing, and, and get into those. But now let's get into the, um, the um, I think, one of the biggest things that we're preparing ourselves for, um, and that really is the, the confession and absolution. And here we come to a very important word, um, a, a very important song in most of our liturgies, um, the Kyrie, which is what we call the first of the orders which means these are the things that are going to be ordinarily sung each Sunday. So a lot of times we talked a little bit this last week where we we have songs that continue from week to week to week to have a sense of continuity from week to week in service. Um, So let's talk a little bit about the confession and absolution and the order 
the first order, the first main song that is traditionally kept, the Kyrie, or which is Greek for Lord have mercy yeah. on me. Um, Kyrie eleison. So let's talk about how the Lord, the divine and the human response here um, in the confession and absolution. What is God doing here? How is God preparing us here? And we'll give Pastor Daisy the first crack at this one. Sure. So kind of going in that order then with the confession and absolution and then the first order of the song. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I'll change it between different services, but regardless of the wording for the confession and absolution, you notice when it comes to the confession, I have not done this. I have done this. It's kind of like Paul, you know, the good I have not done or the bad that I don't want to do, I do, and the good that I do want to do, I don't do, right? And you notice, too, that the way the, that the confession is, is worded is really important because it not only acknowledges the fact that we've actively done evil, but also acknowledges the fact that we've been passive to not doing good. Mm -hmm. um, a young child can read that and, and, and go and look and say, I haven't, I have not been good this week. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's strong language there for that. And, you know, I, I know that uh, sometimes it's interesting to just see the faces of people that are saying that for the first time or saying it for the 15,000th time in their life. Uh, you just see, you know, when life is left in our hands, uh, we are so thoroughly wrought with sin. You know, and it's interesting. We come into the presence of God. We sing praises to God. We hear about what God's word is going to tell us, and bam, the first thing that comes out of our mouths is, "We are sinners." And and I always think of the scene with Isaiah. You know, when he when he goes, "Woe to me!" Like I I see God, and I'm a sinner living among sinful people. And I, I don't know if other people feel this way, but after that confession, and by the way. The pastor confesses that with you because he's also feeling those same things and has done yep. those same things. Um, I'm left with that woe to me. And then, and then what does God do in such a terrible situation with our, you know, terrible, the terrible way that we have lived our lives helplessly in sin is through that pastor, it's not the pastor forgiving you of your sins, but God through that servant says your sins are no more and why? because of our Savior Jesus Christ. And, and then you have that, that, that song, then the Lord have mercy. Um, you know, in, in a sense, a response you know, to what's just happened. And it, I don't know, it's always kind of tied back and forth. Like, uh, you know, we confess our sins, we hear they're forgiven, and then we, we again plead to the Lord for mercy. Mm -hmm. And as we see, as we go on later, which I won't go into, like he answers that with his mercy. Right. Uh, so. I think I think I just like to emphasize, underline something you just said that mm -hmm. the work of God that we've been describing here, and we're going to continue to describe in the next couple of sessions. But isn't it interesting how the historic liturgy, the liturgy that all Christians of all time kind of cobbled together and, and created, as we gather around God's work among us, we have a tendency to hang our response always on the Scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I don't think it's accidental that that in in response to the total depravity that God is God is uh, you know showing us in His law, we collectively have the reaction of the tax collector at the back of the temple. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And yet, I always love how that parable ends. And yet, that man went away. Justified, justified yep. Yep. Uh, before God, and 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 then the, the glory of the absolution. And let's let's talk about. It. I think you did a great job of just bringing that home. But let's talk now. Let's move on to the absolution portion. Uh, mm -hmm. And and one of the things I I really love and I really enjoy. I there is something exciting. I've been a pastor for twenty some years now, but I, I there's an excitement when I turn away from the confession and turn back to the altar or back to the congregation yeah. and yep. and. There's something exciting. Okay, guys, get ready. Here it comes. There's something exciting. So let's talk about the excitement of the absolution. Well, I mean, and, and to me, that's also one where it's not technically against the wall, yeah. but I love yeah. having an altar that is not freestanding mm -hmm. because there is that there is that imagery. When we're facing the altar, we're talking to God, and yet when that pastor turns around, that's God talking through him to you. Mm -hmm. And... You know, for me, the absolution, it's its kind of interesting in, in worship. I was explaining this last night in Bible information class, that in worship, it's its kind of a collective, you are forgiven. I mean, it's never, 
meant to be anything less than a very personal thing, but it's very collective. You are forgiven in the name and by the stead of Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. Um, and I was explaining to them how when I go visit shut-ins, and I probably will never change this, so if you don't like it, I apologize. When I do that, there's a called servant of Christ, Paul, I forgive you all of your sin. And it's just making sure that they know that that's for them. And I mean, it's, it's one where, yes, God is speaking and God is speaking through me to them that they are forgiven. As a called servant of Christ, it is my glad tidings to send you and tell you this fact that you are forgiven. There is now no animosity between you and God. There is nothing stopping you from praising him and loving him and knowing that you are loved by him. And it's just... Yeah, and I was trying to explain, because we were also talking about um, personal confession and absolution. And I was like, you know, at this church, we used to do it until a couple pastors ago, and they stopped. I was like, but I would love to do that for people, because there is just something. In public setting, it's great. It's not diminishing it at all. But when you can talk to your pastor, and you can have that forgiveness pronounced to you, there's just something that people can really hold on to. And it's just just knowing that God has forgiven me. And that's, so we start our service singing, getting God's name placed on us, confessing the wrong that we have done, and yet hearing that God has forgiven us. Like that's... And, and I'm, I'm going to use yeah. a term that I've stolen from, <laughs> stolen from another pastor, but I, if we think of the final part of the service, we'll, we'll talk about the sacrament of the altar. But I always think of the first part of the service as... This is baptismal therapy. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, because really, what it is is, you know, a, a lot. Of, I, I kind of fell into this growing up, where uh, baptism is something that happened to me many years ago by a pastor I never met a long time ago. Yep. And, yep. and I'm, I'm glad it happened. But you, you had this false idea that, oh, I'm, I'm glad it got me in the door, but now I got to wait until I take the Lord's Supper. <laughs> no. Um, actually, you're living in your baptism, and and what was really happening, and even though I didn't understand this, that it was happening because I was being brought to church, because we were going through this, whether we understood it or not, was that I'm, I'm being not merely reminded because it, it is Jesus in the stead and by the command, in the pastor, yep. in, the, in yep. the congregation, yep. doing this, this, yes. In, in other words, you know, I, I like Luther's picture that baptism is a gold ring placed on your finger, but goodness sakes, we, 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 we try to take that ring off almost every moment of every day. Yep. And when we get it, get it back on. Right. You're my bride. Don't forget it. You put the clothes, you, know, you you are that, and that excitement to know that that, and again, I think that um, when we talk about um, whether it's, it's a personal one-on-one, if I sin against my neighbor and we use the keys, or whether it's a, a specific sin that weighs specifically heavy upon me that I need to have some, but isn't it interesting, God doesn't send us a text. God sends us living words in living people right. to right. hold our hand, to look us in the eye, because that's what we need to not only know that we're assured, mm -hmm. but that we have that, that comfort. And again, just adding to that, and we'll get to that when we talk about you know architecture a little bit, but I've always liked the fact that you know the place where the people sit is called the nave. It's a ship. Right. Mm -hmm. And how did you get on this ship? You got on this ship through the through through God's blessing of that and, and you remain on this ship through. And even in our catechism, you know, the traditional layout of the catechism is baptism, then confession and absolution, the keys. Then the Lord's Supper. It isn't interesting how that's mirrored right. very much in the in, in the liturgical service. And so again, you know, we, we talk about, you know, well, it's, it's just the old order of worship. It, there's something deeper here. It's really reflecting that divine rhythm that God is trying to keep with his people and, and something that really is a, a, a beautiful thing. Uh, but being so beautiful, we cannot keep it to ourselves. And so that leads us to our, our next portion of our, our preparation. And I, and I like to put this as kind of the starting block of the race of praise. Um, we've already kind of warmed up, you know, we've, we've stretched our legs in the intro and in the opening psalm, you know. We've, we've, we've you know, we've, we've acknowledged our weakness, we've acknowledged our sin and, and, and been forgiven. But then it's like this gun has gone off and we're out with praise. And here, again, we, we talk about the second order, uh, but we can, with Christian freedom, we can swap that out for any song of praise. Sure. But the second order, which traditionally is the glory, glory to God in the highest, yep. um, and, and praise. And again, that brings us always 
you know, I, I say every Sunday is a little Easter, but also every Sunday is also a little Christmas. Yep. Um, yep. That, that you can't get out without hearing the angels in the fullness of their choir above the fields outside of Bethlehem announcing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men. And let's talk about, you, you, had, you had a law question, I'm going to give you a gospel question. Oh, let's talk about the joy of the song of praise, the joy of, of that. You can talk specifically about the glory to God or any song of praise, but let's just talk, you know, this, again, we're, we're dealing with the rhythm here. Um, so talk, Pastor Basie, about the joy that we get in expressing our joy at what's just happened. All right. I, I don't know. I, I struggle with the right words in this situation. It, you know, it, there are a lot of joys that are temporary. I, I rejoice in the fact my one-year-old just took her first steps about a month ago, and now she won't stop walking, right? I rejoice in the fact that my wife and I have an anniversary coming up here next week. I, I rejoice in these things. Um, I'm not saying that those joys aren't as good, but when you just look at the depravity that, that we, we live in, with, with our sin and just how truly helpless we are. You know, it talks about being dead in our sins and, and hostile enemies to God, right? The big theological word is natural depravity if you want to show off to your neighbor. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, then, then to hear from that same God who didn't have to care, who could have done whatever he wanted um, to us and would have been justified by it, but that your sins are forgiven, I just the natural gut instinct and the cool thing about this joy is as we sing you know the glory to god in the highest glory to the father i mean this is this is a song of praise that echoes into the halls of eternity because guess what we're going to be singing when we're in heaven right guess what we're going to be singing uh now guess what our children lord willing will sing years later i mean it's always going to be that glory to god and why because of what we have just heard Christ has come, our sins are removed, we are at peace with God, and we have forgiveness and eternal life. And there's just not another joy in this world that could grasp that. So it's just this natural, almost oozing, right, of your baptismal, of your baptismal uh, new man that just can't help but just rejoice in the fact that we have this relationship restored. I, I guess that's all I really have. And, so, and I think this is, we talked a little bit about, you know, we talked about this last time, but let people praise you, but... You know, I've, I've always argued vehemently with anybody who says, well, Lutheran worship is unemotional. Oh, goodness sakes, how can you possibly say that? That's nah, garbage. Uh, it's garbage. Yeah. Um, Lutheran worship is one of the most emotional things in the world. What Lutheran worship is not is performative. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, we're, not, we're not gathered into a theater to watch somebody perform. Yep. We are all part of this, and ultimately the person performing the most action is God. Um, and, uh, you know, God, first of all, in his forgiving and absolving us, um, but we in response to that. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not that, it's really this, that, that God is always making his move toward us. There's that theocentric worship, but that we respond to him. And, and I respond to him, and I want to respond to right. him, and, and I, right. I, I, I can't keep quiet about it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one of the, one of the, uh, um, Christmas hymns, uh, Yaroslav Vita's Christmas hymn, uh, where shepherds lately knelt. You know, how, how could I, uh, uh, how, love so deeply burned into my heart, unasked, unforced, unearned, uh, uh, to live and die for such a one as me. You know, and like, you know, it's just like, I didn't ask for any of this. Right. I didn't want, and yet God just, I'm going to just find you and hunt you down. Or, you know, Paul Gerhardt's great hymn, um, where, you know, what wonder, uh, you know, what wondrous love, or, or wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up the Son, desiring my salvation. Who am I that you would do that? That the Son would willingly become a, a, a creature like me, so that I could be the Son of God, and that you cannot get over that. And I think one other aspect, maybe, maybe we have you talk about this a little bit, but I, I also think this is one of those excellent places where worship is not just local. When we worship, we are worshiping with. All the saints of heaven, right. all the angels of heaven, all the believers on earth and in heaven. And though we, we are confined to a local presence right now, again, we are crossing over that line of in, into the spiritual reality where I really am united with all believers. And let's just talk about how that aspect really fills us with joy. 
um, especially the song of praise. Well, I mean, I I would honestly hope that it does because it's it's a chance where this is where I'm a bad pastor because I should remember the seven major parts of the worship and I can't remember the order, but I know invocation. Um, the Gloria makes it, the Kyrie makes it, and there are others. But these are portions of worship that, you know, as we were talking about, it'll change. It might, the liturgy might look different. But these portions generally are there always. Everyone has them. So it's not just, you know, us in this church doing this right now, but it's also down in Winthrop, you guys are doing it too. Down in Sanborn, you're doing the same thing. And it's it, it's one that hopefully people do hold on to that it's not just us here it is grandma and grandpa did this 60 years ago it is my grandkids are going to learn this as they come through here too it is my brother and sister who moved 2,000 miles away they're doing the exact same thing that we are right now and there's just something there's just comfort in that that this we're all doing this together and maybe not at the exact moment, but, you know, we're all doing this together. You can walk into any of these one churches and it might, there's going to be a different feel, but these same parts just keep coming back and washing over you because they're just, they're, they're what's important. They're, they're well, what and, needs and to stay. And it's really the spirit song because we're taking right, these like, words from yeah. the scriptures. Right. And you said 2,000 miles down the road, but I think it's also 2,000, 4,000. I'm united with people. Right. Looking oh, forward right, to Christ, right. but yeah. also united with some believer I don't even I can't even conceive of. Right. Maybe yep. two hundred, three hundred, maybe a thousand years. Who knows how long the world will last? Um, in the future, you know, Luther always thought that he was living in the end times. So right. We're, we're still here five hundred <laughs> years later. Um, but but Luther's also united with us as well, and yep. that that glory that we we give, and no matter if it's two people in a, in a in a you know in a small congregation. I remember when I was vicaring. Um, Actually, when I was in seminary, I would go down. There was this tiny little church that would worship in Chicago, in a very rough part of Chicago. There was only about 15 people who would gather for worship there. But you know, they sang the same songs, and they and they and they and they. And, they, and what was really interesting to me is that I would I was the, they, the congregation was primarily African American, and yet they're singing all the same sure. songs and the music. And it's and, and this is God's way, and it's God's worship, and it's a beautiful thing. And we are we are so filled with that joy and that that excitement at the, at the same time. Um, but again, it's it's that that wonder. Um, we're almost out of time, so I do want to get to the, the kind of the, the closing part. I would say of the this this entrance, this idea that we are we are coming in, and it really is the prayer of the day, uh, traditionally called the collect, yep. um, but uh, more in, in modern hymnals, it's referred to mostly as the prayer right. of the day. But let's talk a little bit about the prayer of the day. How, in, in some ways, is that not only a summation of everything we've just talked about, but also a preparation now that we're ready to listen mm-hmm. for what we're about to hear? We'll give uh, Pastor Casey the first shot, and we'll get to go back to Pastor at the time. Sure. So one of the things I like about it, and you probably don't know this if you're not a pastor, but in, in some of our resources, they list a prayer of the day for each Sunday based on the theme and what's nice is recently in the new resources we have it lists some of the historical records which would it just adds a nice bit of flavor you know um, I'm trying to think of an example of course I'm going blank but uh, it helps it helps me understand where this prayer of the day is kind of coming from where it originated from why was this selected and what's the history of this and I mean you, you can tell as you listen to that prayer of the day you know and I'd say almost always, um, but there's always there's always a reflection uh, of Lord, you have done this, therefore help us do this, and we pray this through through Jesus, you know, who lives with the Holy Spirit, one God, you know, forever and ever, Amen. And it ends in some form, but there's always that action of God has done this, and that's usually talking about the theme of the Sunday. So so uh, like last Sunday we talked about. Uh, Oh, what was it? It was uh, the church pre- preaches, preaches Christ despite persecution, right? It was the last one of that holy ministry theme mm-hmm. uh, with the, the new lectionary. And so that was in there, like, Christ, you have done this. You sustained us. You have made us able to endure. Now help us live in this life to deal with the pressure of persecution. Uh, and if you listen, that kind of will tell you the theme of the church better and two sentences than me telling you it in five minutes uh it, it's just a nice summary and it's a nice way like you said to kind of kind of start on the right foot is it is it chips 
they say you always walk on a ship with your right foot first, mm-hmm. right? Never your left. I don't know where that came from. I don't know why I remember that. But it, that's kind of the prayer of the day is too. We start in the right step, you know. Mm-hmm. These are the main themes. So it, it's yeah. kind of interesting. The colic has, has been traditionally called the people's prayer. Um, when you think of the prayer after the sermon, the, the, the prayer of the church. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in many ways, it's like okay. God, thank you for clearing those clouds. Mm-hmm. Thank you for clearing my heart, and I am ready. You know, and I, I've always felt this as a pastor, but I think I feel it more in the in the rare times I do get to sit with my family. But I am so ready to listen at that point. Right. Mm-hmm. I am. I am just so ready. Okay, lay it on me, <laughs> and, and not just the the lessons of the day. We'll get to that next next week, but. Uh, but the, the theme of the day, uh, the, the sermon, um, and, and to bring us uh, along those. Well. Uh, I'm going to give you the last uh, word today, uh, Jesse, about anything, uh, colic of the day, or anything that you'd like to uh, add, and then we'll, uh, we'll come bring our, bring our stuff to an end. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's just, it, it, not only with the theme of the day, as you kind of mentioned it, if I remember right, the colics of the day are based, not based on, but are supposed to kind of be reflective of the gospel because it's usually the gospel that's preached on. Mm -hmm. And so it's also one where, so like we print them and actually as a church, we say them together. I know some churches, it's just the pastor, but we actually, the prayer of the day, that's what we do there. Yeah, for the prayer of the day, the collect, we do it together. Mm -hmm. And it's just a chance, again, hopefully, that some of them are realizing that, yes, this is precisely what the gospel is talking about. You know, we, we are thanking God for what we're going to learn very shortly. And it's just us getting ready for that also. So, yeah. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us today. And uh, next week we're going to get into uh, the service of the word, uh, the second portion of uh, our traditional worship, uh, looking at the different readings and, and the connective tissue between those readings and the sermon. And, and uh, we'll have plenty of good stuff there today. Uh, we wish you a very uh, happy and safe 4th of July. Uh, yes. Please keep our country uh, in your prayers, especially at this time, but also uh, take the wonderful uh, um, time afforded to you uh, by your employer, by our government, and celebrate the blessings that uh, God has given to our country, especially the freedom to worship and preach the gospel that we have by God's grace still been given. And uh, spend that time uh, enjoying that uh, blessing as well. Let us uh, close with prayer. I will, uh, I will bring the closing prayer today. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, bringing us into your presence. Thank you for clearing the clouds, the self-centeredness, the self-righteousness that uh, many times we fall and, and walk into, and setting our heart aright where we went wrong, coming back to see your face and, and your name. But most importantly, we thank you, Lord, for coming to us and showing us not only our sin, but more graciously showing us that you have redeemed us from our sin, not because of anything we have earned or deserved, but purely of your fatherly divine goodness and mercy. Uh, let us respond to your grace, sing forth, praise for us, and most importantly, listen to open our ears to what you have to tell us and teach us as we walk through this veil of tears, following your righteous shepherd staff um, to the good pasture of green fields and in good water, but ultimately to the banquet table you have set before us in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.